Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode here on Tales from the Wandering Scribe. I am your host, Gabo Garcia, otherwise known as the Wandering Scribe and the Wandering Quill. Joining me today is another historian for a historian's interview. My guest today was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. He holds a graduate degree in world history from Norwich University in Vermont and teaches history at Joyla Junior College. His areas of interest include ancient Egypt, Greek mythology, classical Greek, Greek and Roman warfare, Philip II and Alexander the Great, the Hellenistic world, the Roman Republic, and the Roman Empire. His graduate school capstone focused on using military intelligence in Julius Caesar's army during the Gallic War. Ancient military intelligence has often been overlooked, and he hopes to contribute extensively. He's also committed to furthering his knowledge of history and staying on the forefront with the latest scholarship in ancient history. He is a member of the Association of Ancient Historians, the Society of Classical Studies, and the Society for the Study of the Crusades and the Latin East. And he studies a whole bunch more in the medieval period, which include the events of 1060 AD, the Plantagenist dynasty, the Middle Ages, the Crusades, and the Byzantine Empire. So let's give a big round of applause to a first-timer here on the channel, Professor Phil Matthews. Phil, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. You're welcome. So to start of start off um, in this interview, uh, tell us a bit more um, about yourself and your uh, road uh, through history from, you know, schooling, uh, what made you decide to pursue history as a profession, and uh, where you're at right now in your life? Um, well, I, I'm an ancient historian. I, I'm the only ancient historian in my department where I teach. I teach at Juliet Junior College just outside of Chicago, and um, yeah, I do Greek Roman history. I do a lot on ancient warfare and as well as some of social political history as well. And um, yeah, th this is something that's that I've always had um, as a passion since I was a kid. I mean, one of my earliest memories is reading like a, a little comic strip of it, it, it's an old book called The Picture Bible. You know, my I'm born and raised in a Catholic family and. The picture Bible had, like, especially in the Old Testament section, had a lot of illustrations that showed how people dressed in ancient Egypt, Babylon, ancient Israel, Persia, and then we get into the Romans as well. And like, you know, it's the, and then it's their architecture in all their cities as well. I, you know, when I, my, some of my earliest memories as a kid was reading through stuff like that. And then something about it just really captivated me and in the like especially with the earlier stuff when you talk about the book of genesis that kind of stuff mm -hmm. it was egypt that really that really fascinated me like i was fascinated by the pyramids i was fascinated by the way egyptians dressed and and then it just went from that point forward i just had this interest in reading or anything i could get my hands on on ancient history. And, you know, I, I love going to museums. Museums are just one of my favorite pastimes because, and, and, and any, any time there's an ancient exhibit, like here in Chicago, we have the Field Museum. They have a great ancient Egyptian exhibit. And they did have a Greek exhibit back in like 2016, 2000, two, I think it started in 2015, went into 2016. And yeah, it was, they brought so many Greek artifacts there. And then so, you know, anytime there's something like that, I'm always down for, for that. You know, so, so this is something that I've developed as a, as a kid onwards. And then, yeah, when I went to school, yeah, I, I uh, not only studied this, but I studied all periods of history. You know, there's nice. American, European, and such. And then in graduate school, um, I decided on the world history focus because that would give me the most exposure with ancient and yeah, like I, I, I it's and of course it studied more than it covered more than ancient e history. It covered the early modern to modern periods as well. Mm -hmm. And uh but but ultimately, um, you know, my capstone, my final project was on Roman um history because you know this this has probably been 
the ones where I felt like we have the best grasp on the best, the most number of primary sources right. and such. And then I, it, it just got so interesting to me. And, you know, I'm, and anytime there's like an ancient history film, not, not every one of them, but, but, uh, you know, a film like Gladiator or mm -hmm. a film and such, you know, these are films that, you know, really catch my interest. I'm also a big fan of the uh, sword and sandal uh, films from the fifties and sixties. Like nice. Ben Hur, Ben Hur, Spartacus, Fall of the Roman Empire. I've seen, and and I and I and I also liked Alexander the Great and Cleopatra, both of which had Richard Burton in them. <laughs> you know, the, these were films that really caught my interest. You know? So this is something I've had since I was a kid, and I just and you know down the road they say you know you got to do something that makes you happy. You know, you got to do something, and then this is. This is what I figured I really liked. And the the other thing is there have been teachers on my mom's side of the family. Oh, so okay. I think that's what really got me. And of course, they all taught, they all taught in science. I ah, had a okay. I taught I had a completely different interest though. Nice. Okay. All right. You know, you're probably actually the second guest I've had who's uh, kind of almost had the same thing, like pursuing history was one of your interests and i'm actually glad you brought this uh sword and sandals because i love the sword and sandals movies of the era like the 50s and like sometimes the 60s and looking back at them yes you can argue that some parts are not historically accurate but it's just a fun it's just a way to escape back into the classical period like of course the fall of the roman empire ben hur um the ten commandments that movie those are really great um peer pieces at the time and we learn a lot from them and kind of going off from there um phil um as a teacher what is sort of like the promise you're making up to your students who like take your classes and i say that in a sense that i'm sure you know um throughout your school you probably have had a lot of different professors who have taught history in a different way from a different discipline so when you are teaching history to your students what is the promise you're making to them? I think the, the big promise I, I make them is that they, that when they leave this classroom, they're going to have a better understanding, a better knowledge of ancient history, and of and a, and a sense of the, and a sense of themselves. Think of the, a sense of where where things came from. Because you know, one of the things that I really like to point out in my classes is I like to talk about. With, with ancient history, where, where certain things started, and when 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 they get a better understanding of that, then they understand how that relates to today. So you know that's one of the big reasons why we study history, right? So that we we could like one thing is one one example is uh, I teach them about, when I teach the Greeks and the Romans, like uh, where a lot of our words in English how they are connected to the Greek and Latin. Greek and Latin languages, like like you know, especially the etymology, that stuff. Like they learn where the term Narcissus comes from, where the terms mm -hmm. uh, and other things. And and uh, probably the biggest one is, I, I when I teach them about the Romans, I do put emphasis on Constantine, and I talk about how Christianity came in the Roman Empire, how it became a prominent religion, and because it's the dominant religion of the Western world today, and. Yes. When they learn about Constantine, they they then they understand like how this was set in motion. It's a turning point in mm -hmm. history, you know. And and I've had students who told me they found that interesting that this is how where, where it really began. They like how Christianity was one Christians were once persecuted in the Roman Empire. Then they then it becomes the dominant religion of the empire. Yes, I I one hundred percent, especially when you look at that period in Roman history, it, it is always fascinating. And everything in, I'm sure you would probably agree. Like in the scholarship of the classical world, especially for Rome, uh, that part of Roman history kind of gets like overlooked. We often have research on the Roman Republic, the early uh, Pax Romanum period, and then when we get into like the crisis of the third century, and then towards the end of the Roman Empire, specifically speaking, the Western Empire. No one really puts a lot of emphasis on that. So I'm actually glad you actually introduced that to your students. And what has sort of been like the overall feedback like 
um, when teaching your students and kind of going a step further, when you began uh, teaching for the very first time, what were the initial reactions from your student on your teaching style and how you taught history? They actually, they actually liked it. They, they, they found it, um, they found all of this pretty fascinating. Well, oh, one other thing I forgot to mention was um, one way that I do get them engaged in this is I give them paper assignments where they look at primary sources from the time period or close to the time period. And then when they read these, I want I have them engage in, in, in keep questions in mind, like, is the author biased? Who's the author's target audience? To what sense is this propaganda? That kind of thing. You know, you got to look at these primary sources from an, right. a more analytical perspective. And then you got to understand because we don't take all of that um, for we don't we don't take it all, all like a, as an absolute. Definitely. I 100% I agree. That's actually the same teaching um, my professor taught me when researching a primary source, especially in like the 1500s um, for uh, late medieval Spain or early modern um, Spain, where we have all these documents. And it's like they are a source of knowledge, but we have to take them with a grain of salt because, as you said, Phil, we have to think, well, who is the author writing for? Um, what is their background when writing this? Are they biased? Are they doing this for someone else? Those are the things we have to look into. And I think that is a style of learning history that I feel that not a lot of people really understand. And so with that in mind, and looking back now where you're at in your life right now, have you do you feel that your promise to your students has been uh, validated? Have students actually approached you maybe like end of class or maybe towards like the end of like the semester where they've approached you and like say, you know, I really really learned a lot you really opened my understanding of history oh yeah that's ha that has happened before like like uh fall 2022 i remember a student who he told me his favorite person in history was like mine alexander the great and he asked me for book recommendations on alexander and then i put him in that direction and because i well of course the books i recommended were much older ones that right. were considered uh bigger ones yeah those historians have now passed away but their work has uh has been amazing it's probably been some of the most accurate i'm talking about authors like nicholas hammond mm -hmm. uh, maybe bosworth yes uh, Conquest of empire mm -hmm. yeah and and yeah i mean they 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 really found found all of this fascinating you know my, my students i've got i got e i got emails from them, uh, you know, for these things I've got, they ask for letters of recommendation and then I provide that. That's incredible. I'm actually glad that, you know, there's still a lot of people that are interested in the the classical world and the classical history. And it is really fascinating to know about the past because as you said, learning from the past helps us understand the future, how all these words that we use nowadays, it stems back from the past. Everything in our understanding goes back to the Greeks, the Romans, uh, medieval Europe, everything which all has a purpose. And it, it just so fascinating just learning about all of this. But I also think when it comes to like studying history, be it, you know, historians, professors, authors, it is kind of a, a lonely process in the sense that, you know, we dedicate ourselves to our fields, to our professions, and it does kind of get a sense of overwhelming and I've always talked about there's all my guests who are historians that being a historian, no matter what field you are, it is a very lonely profession where you're dedicating hours into a research, into projects. And so my question to you now, uh, Phil, which is a two parter, um, when you began your historical journey um, into teaching, what still pushed you to pursue history? when at times there may have been doubt in the back of your mind saying, am I really going to do this? Am I actually going to make a difference? Or I don't know if I can keep doing this anymore. What motivated you to still keep going? And what still motivates you now going forward? I mean, what motivated me at first, you know, to go into it was, you know, I knew that this is something I always wanted. It's um, something, you know, everybody says, you know, you got to do something that you like, you know, and, you know, even if, even if it's uh, 
for a, sh a short period of time in your life. Like, you, you know, like someone told me you'd rather live a short life doing something what you really want to do rather than live a long life doing what you don't want to do. And I think what really, and then once I got into it, like once I got this job, I, yeah, I put into it 100% of everything I dreamed of doing because I knew um, what I would do one day if I, you know, if I went into teaching, you know, they, uh, and then I just, I just put it in there and then I, I put everything I knew, I applied it all. And, I, and then what kept me going was like positive feedback from students, you know, students who enjoy this. And the other thing is a good work environment with a lot of my colleagues. You know, you got to have, you know, colleagues that, you know, you, you, I mean, I, well, I work in a department where we're called social behavioral sciences. So, All right. you know, my, my current boss teaches, uh, department chair teaches psychology and such. And we also have sociology, anthropology, political science. My, my colleagues who are historians, we all work together very well. And I think that creates a really good um, environment. It gives, pos gives positive feedback. And it, it keeps it keeps you going because you know we bounce ideas off of each other, and we've given each other, um, um, I you know ideas and you know advice because oftentimes we have to teach outside of our areas, you know because so I've had to teach American history in addition to like modern European right. and modern world, and so my colleagues who are American historians, I've bounced ideas off of them about like the American Revolution, World War II and other things and then they've i've given them advice on the ancient world like they've proven knowledgeable but um there's a few things they didn't know that you know i i helped them so you know this is the thing when you work right. together with people like that it really creates a, a really good work environment yeah, and that really motivates you i couldn't agree more and i also think that's probably the best thing when it comes to working with like other historians is the camaraderie and the connections that we make because as you said which is 100% true. We are always bouncing off ideas and we always work um, with each other to try to learn new things. And when I began this journey, I didn't think I would meet a lot of different historians from different backgrounds, whether it's U.S. history, uh, presidential history, uh, more uh, classical historians, medievalists. It's so fascinating. And, you know, when I look back at to see how many people I've interviewed and how many people I've talked, I always think, wow, my life could have gone completely different had I not pursued this. And that's kind of an old question you used to ask my guests. And now I turn over to you, uh, uh, Phil. Have you ever had that thought? It's like, you know, what would my life be like if I didn't pursue, you know, teaching? If I still want to actively teach history, but not in the educational sense as a professor? Um, you're asking... Like what if 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 I if I didn't pursue teaching, what would I? Yeah. So if you didn't go into teaching, where would you see your life now with your teach with your knowledge of classical history? Where would you imagine yourself be at this point in your life right now? Uh, I'd say my other thing would be would would be to uh, be in a museum or do some archaeological work because you know I have tra traveled to. Um, different parts of Europe and, and Asia. And when I see a historical site, I'm a kid in a candy store. And, <laughs> uh, and um, I always think about it's cool to uh, survey the area and make any new discoveries, you know, as I've, you know, like you know, summer 2022, I was in Greece and I had that same feeling wow. when I went to the different sites. I, you know, like going to uh, Agamemnon's tomb in Mycenae was like probably the one of the most mind boggling things I've seen I'm like and and the Oracle at Delphi and 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 going to Corinth you know it's it's just cool you know I would just love to spend hours at those sites and learning all all, all I can and of course you know when if they're they're paying you to go and find something new I'm, I mean I I would take a long, long time there you know doing because you know it's something I would I wouldn't want to leave you know so yeah I mean um it's it's kind of you know it's kind of like that you know that Indiana Jones feel to it nice that's actually pretty awesome it's actually you brought that up because initially that was actually my 
goal when I got my historical degree was actually to go in museums and to be like an archivist, a researcher. But then, you know, I took a different path and I turned more into writing, which is another one of my passions, which is writing about history. And I absolutely love. And when I began writing history, I learned back at my you know professors who have really molded my historical thought process. And that going to uh, you, Phil, um, what sort of professors would you say have had a huge impact into your historical upbringing who have really left an impression on you? You know, a lot, a lot of my professors are my undergrad, graduate school. There's probably too many to name because, you know, they all showed that they had a they had a great they had a great passion for teaching history, even if they, it was an area different from mine. And it's just something like observing their teaching style and what assignments they give, everything. You know, I think this is what I learned along the way in in becoming a teacher. So I, I've learned this from one, one two, two, so many of my prof professors. Like you know, and one one of them once told me that you know all professors are different. They're all shaped by the professors who molded them. Right. And and um, I, I would say almost every all all, all my professors there's just one I, like i said there's one too many to name but i've followed their teaching styles and they and and, and what assignments they do and i realize what and i mean of course you do like whatever whatever they all do in in common like something that that you got you have to do when teaching but uh yeah i think i think um they they're, they're the ones who really helped me help shape me into becoming a teacher it's like so this is both undergrad and grad school Nice, nice. So you, so there's really like no. If you had to choose one professor, I know as you said, there's like too many to name uh, from that have really like made a huge impact. But if you had to choose a uh, one to like give like a a shout out to either undergraduate or graduate, who would you like to tell the listeners and viewers of you know how they impacted your um, historical uh, journey? I would probably um, choose uh, my advisor for my capstone in grad school. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with med medieval historian uh, Kelly DeVries. He's a big I military. He's a big military historian. So. No, he's, a big milita he's a big military historian on the medieval world, but he also has written a lot on the on the ancient world too. You know, he, this guy. You know, I've seen him. Uh, he travels the world, yeah, like every summer. Like he'll go to England, he'll go to Italy, he'll go, and while he's doing that, he's still teaching an online course. Wow! Doing that, like that, one of the courses I had with him, he was teaching to us online through that. This was a long, long time ago, and he, you know, he's published extensively in the field. I've seen him in many documentaries, and like, um, especially on ancient Rome, as well as well as medieval history. And he and I have kept in touch. We've bounced some ideas and shared ideas with each other you know i've asked him for advice as well yeah i mean I, yeah he, he's I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if they they probably said he's one of the most the foremost medieval historians in the world but yeah his background's mostly um medieval military history but he's done a lot with ancient uh, as well fascinating yeah i've never heard of of this um, individual i probably have to look him up to learn more about him so I'm glad that you have like had a lot of professors that have really molded your life and really pushed you. And kind of almost on that uh, question, would you say that these professors have also pushed you to be um, like a better historian, not in the sense of like learning history, but also teaching history? Yeah, I, I believe so. Because... Uh... You know, learn. You know, when you learn the historical method, when you learn how uh, how historians approach history, and you engage in that, you know, it was something I just really, really loved to to do. I realized looking at it from an analytical perspective, rather than just taking your word from it, taking your word for it from like a documentary or uh, something that people, other people say, if it's something opinionated, then you know, these these professors really pushed me to analyze the evidence for myself, make my right. own conclusions. You know, I feel like, uh, yeah, I feel like that's that's one, one of the big positive things they've helped me with. That's amazing. That's 
that's honestly why I love history, that it pushes us to be the best version of ourselves and to create discussion with people to help, you know, educate others. And that's always like the three is I like to always say, which I haven't used in a long time, which is educate, entertain, depending on like what the history is and enlighten, because it is really important to study history because history is constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. We're always either dissecting old material or re-examining. And sometimes it's a messy process, but it is a necessary process. And sort of kind of along those lines of, you know, meeting professors and like teaching, uh, is there any other projects that you're uh, working on besides um, uh, teaching? Are you doing any academic papers, part of any um, society as well? As you mentioned before, you are part of a lot of uh, different societies in history. So I wonder if you can also tell us about those as well and what their uh, role is in the historical community. Yeah, I've, um, I, I think I've, I've told you before, I've uh, published a lot with World History Encyclopedia. I've written a lot of articles. I've written book reviews and such. Yeah, a lot of them have been Greek topics and, you know, there have been some Roman ones. A lot of the books so far have been Roman ones. They, you know, and, and these articles and book reviews have been peer reviewed and they, and, and they, they thought they were good. And, um, yeah, moving forward, um, yeah, like with one of my professional memberships, it's the Society for Classical Studies. Um, I've in one of their meetings, I've met with a bunch of publishers, whether they be from Oxford, Yale, University of Illinois, University of Wisconsin, Michigan, and I've talked to them about, um, you know, writing a, about getting a book published. Nice, that's actually incredible. So it, it would be. Yeah, because um, I've, you know, I've been to uh, conferences where uh, my, the topic of my capstone about Roman military intelligence gathering is in the Roman army. Like in my, as I told you, my capstone was on Caesar and the Gallic War. Right. And uh, I was hoping to put that into a book as well. Because, you know, I've met with someone at a conference once who was, analyzing um this same theme but with the late roman army and then ah. we, and then we met we exchanged ideas and such and when they presented that paper everybody agreed at the conference that this is something where more work needs to be done because this is um one of those in, one of those um situations where you're applying a modern term and modern concepts to the ancient world and uh you know, that, that's not always easy, but no, it is it's, not. Uh, but with this one, you know, it's understandable because, you know, it, it, you got to know about your enemy. You, you, these armies, they, these armies, these factions, they had to know about their enemies. They had to mm -hmm. know about that in order to win a battle. So they had to um, perform re reconnaissance units. They had to gather intelligence. So this is something I'm hoping to turn into a book because there's only been a few studies done on it. There's been, you know, I have... Like books and articles about it. One of the, one of the articles was actually called the miss the missing dimension of Gaius Julius Caesar. And Ooh, the missing okay. dimension the missing dimension was this about how his army used intelligence gathering in the Gallic War and the Civil War. Oh, that's actually pretty fascinating. You know, that kind of reminds me of. Have you are you familiar with um the I forgot the author's name. But the book title is called Roman Special Forces. Have you heard of that book before? If you tell me the author. Uh, I, I may have to send you it later. But um, it's actually almost along the lines of what you're, uh, what you're talking about because it is examining the scholarship of the war specifically in the, the Roman East and looking at these elite, as what we would use, spies and special forces of the Roman Empire in Syria, in uh, the Levant region. And it's just so fascinating because you're right, it is an aspect that we really don't pay a lot into the military side. We, yes, we have all the journals and the writings of Julius Caesar, who, for people who have not read uh, the writings of Julius Caesar, he wrote everything down about his Gallic campaigns. He's probably the most detailed accountant of those battles, and it is just incredibly fascinating. So I urge everyone to take a look at that. 
but yeah, going back to your original question, that's actually really fascinating to um, explore. And ultimately, kind of leading on to the book, um, what else do you hope to expand upon in the book that you didn't get a chance to do in your capstone, your thesis? Um, probably, yeah, the things to expand on are just uh you know it's not just just uh the just the thing the the idea that um this is something that it's open to interpretation it's something that um you know more work needs to be done that's the message i would put there and i would explore more into you know make people more familiar with the the different units that the romans use for spying and intelligence you know i i realize you could write you could write um books for uh general readers on just those units in, in the roman army you know it's something you could add to books on the roman army and i feel and um because you don't see you don't see a lot of that no you and don't the, and the the other thing is that is well and then i just want people to just make the message clear that you know with that this is something that's essential to uh for armies to win Victory. So, so this is this is going to further our understanding of military history, if we uh, apply apply this. You know, there there's other topics where they said it can be a lot more tricky, but this one I feel like is it's important. Nice, nice. fascinating. Nice. Well, I hope it does come to fruition because if that book does come out, I am definitely going to read it because I would love to add that to my collection. Um, you probably can't see it, but off to my left, I have a whole library of reference books that I use for research and writing. And honestly, I just love, you know, expanding my knowledge. And, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier about connections, especially with historians and meeting all these new people, it is kind of, in a sense, a little intimidating going into this established field as a first timer in the sense that, you know, you've learned all you wanna know about history or your field in history, you're now part of this either group of people, um, either if it's in like uh, an academic setting or a society setting. And it does kind of sense like, you know, a little, as I said, intimidating because, you know, do I actually fit in here? Do I actually belong here? So uh, for you, um, Phil, um, have you ever gotten a sense of validation from your fellow peers in the sense that, you know, this is where um, you belong. Because it's one thing to actually be in a group, be it like historical, scientific, philosophical, or any other field or any other group. But it's another thing when your peers recognize you and say, you did good, you belong here. Or do you not sort of seek um, validation like as like a forefront? Uh, could you rephrase that a bit? Of course, of course. So have you ever gotten validation from your fellow um, academics in the sense that where they say, you know, this is where um, you uh, belong in this field? And I ask that question because a lot of my guests, when they've entered um, history, there is a sense of intimidation and trying to feel I like you like actually belong here. but when they meet others who see their achievements and tell them, hey, you did good, that kind of boosts their um, confidence. Yeah, I've gotten that from people I work with and other historians I know through the, you know, this other associations and societies and the professional membership. Oh, yeah, yeah, because, you know, we, we um, at my work, some of us, um, we have to get um, be under observation like um, every year by, you know, whether it be by, you know, it used to be by our department chair, but now it's by whoever the history coordinator is, and they've given me good feedback, you know, right. so, um, yeah, so, um, and then, you know, when I get the positive feedback, you know, it, it just gives me that sense of, you know, that this is where I belong, this is what I um, am good at, you know, and then, you know, and, you know, th this is something I just want to keep, keep pursuing, you know, it's, and, and it's not just positive feedback from, fellow academics and such but like i said in in my where i work 
it's also the students, their positive feedback that also helps. So when you get all put all that together, that, then that's a really big motivator. I 100% agree. It is a huge thing when a when your peers like give you positive feedback and also um, teaching students about history. I myself being also for those who know as a tutor teaching history. I love teaching history. It's probably one of my favorite subjects to help reteach and tutor, especially those that have really never taken an interest in um, history and then sort of like re uh, teaching it to where it is more, you know, engaging and accessible. And I think that's another question that I do want to ask on you, uh, Phil. Like, how do you sort of like teach history to where it's engaging? And people I take away from it because I'm sure you probably have known, like maybe Greg growing up and like being taught history yourself, how you were taught uh, history is probably not the same way in the sense that you want to teach um, your students in the sense like memorization of dates, people, just like memorization as like the forefront and not truly grasping the historical connection. Yeah, that's something that everybody should know. History is more than just memorizing dates, memorizing events, memorizing people. It's the more important thing is how those people have played a role in history. How have those events shaped history? And yeah, I, I want them to get that set, get a sense of that. You know, a sense of community, a sense of understanding uh, of understanding our past, how we got here today. That's what I really want them to understand. You know, so you're, so that they. If that's something that's important. They they need to know history is more than just memorizing dates, people, and events. You, you got to understand the role they played. Right. I I one hundred percent agree, and it is really fascinating when you get a chance to really um, examine history. And kind of one last question before I go into the final two questions of the interview is, how do you sort of like approach a talking about a historical topic which may be considered controversial in like the um the in the modern sense um i've had one professor on here who uh talks well she's more of like more modern history but still when we talk about a topic that correlates to the modern times there is kind of like that tightrope of like how do we discuss it to where there's not going to be um, an issue of her thing, which I've always loved, which is when we teach history like that, or just history in general, it's a baseball bat to the face. It's going to hurt. It's going to make you uncomfortable, but it is important. So for you, uh, Phil, how do you sort of like teach like topics, which may be considered, uh, controversial or maybe bring up, uh, difficult discussions, be it, in the classical era, the medieval era, or the pre-modern and early modern era? Well, approaching that, you know, you got to start, you got to approach it with, without any bias. You have, you have to teach it from um, a perspective that is kind of a common ground between, uh, between two, two different sides, whether, you know, if it's a, you're teaching it like good or bad, and such, you know, you got to teach it more from a perspective that it is appropriate to talk about, you know, and it's right. a way that, you know, people don't become sensitive because, you know, there, there are, I understand there's a lot of topics out there that are sensitive to people. Mm -hmm. And, and the thing is, you know, you got just got to be careful, you know, don't with, with, with what you, you, with what you teach, what, what words you use and such, you know, it's, it's something I've done. You know, when I've taught modern history, I've had to when I've had to teach the Holocaust, I've had to teach about African Americans in American society, you know, and you know, and and you know, and there's there's topics of you know racism, slander, and this stuff. You know, you just got to approach it in an, in a non biased way. You got to be care be careful what you say. You know, this this is always. And then when you you know, every time I've approached it in the best way possible, like that, that they get engaged, and right. then they they right. they understand it in a in a better sense and well but with my field mainly with the ancient world um i haven't run into that problem when teaching when teaching that however with the crusades you know that's one medieval topic that does yes. have some 
um, some things like uh, I have taught it from a to, um, mainly from the we the Western perspective, but I'm not saying it in a in a way that it could be sensitive to other people. You know, what there was one summer where I was teaching the Crusades one time, and then I had four international students from Saudi Arabia who told me they were Muslim. They um, grew up in Saudi Arabia learning about the Crusades from the Muslim perspective, but they learned about the Western perspective from me, and they told me that they found it fascinating learning it from the other perspective because th they were tolerant of it. They thought it was, they now have a well-rounded picture of, of, of the Crusades from different perspectives. So it wasn't really sensitive to them. Awesome. That's actually really, really cool. And it goes back to everything that we uh, we talked about, listeners, that for history with any side, you do need all the information from two different sides or even multiple sides to get the full picture. Because history is often not straightforward. It is messy. It has branching historiographies. And sometimes, 9 out of 10, you may not get the full picture, but you may get close. And ultimately, that's the that's the end goal, just to teach history as best as we can without having like a bias, trying to be as truthful and authentic as possible. And we're now nearing the end of the interview, Phil. And it's probably like the last, so second to last question before we end is, what is your word of wisdom to those that want to study history and go into the educational world as a store, as history professors history teachers, and so forth. Oh, with that, um, I always like to use my favorite quote from, this is probably one of my favorite quotes of all time, was from Cicero. He always said, like, to know nothing of what happened before you were born is to remain forever a child. So, you know, that's an important reason why we study history. We had, you know, if, if we don't know much about our past, how things got here, then... We, we don't really know everything. We don't know the full picture of how, how we got there. You know, we lose a part of our past. We, you know, it's, an, it's important to understand. And then, of course, people always say that's the reason why, when, when, one of the reasons why is so we don't repeat those any mistakes. Right. And, and, and it's honestly true. I actually love you brought that quote because it, it is really fascinating. And I honestly, I couldn't agree more. That is truly truly the basis for studying history and i absolutely love it and with that listeners we conclude this wonderful interview uh with professor phil matthews but before we officially end today i want to thank our guests for joining us and providing his insight and phil can you let us know if there's any projects that you're working on any papers that we should be looking out for or Anything um, in the historical world that you're a part of that you want uh, to make those aware of? Uh, you know, the only work, the best work in progress right now is that is the book I mentioned. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, but you also, as you mentioned, you've written a lot of articles on ancient encyclopedia, correct? You would, you would like to highlight uh, those or where people can find you on ancient encyclopedia or world history encyclopedia? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. With those, I'm currently uh, doing a writing a project about Nero and the Pisonian conspiracy. Ooh, nice, very nice. Well, I will link all those down uh, below uh, for those who want to check out uh, Professor Phil Matthews' uh, writings, and I will also link down his LinkedIn if you want to reach out to him to know more about. Uh, history or so forth or we just want to connect and talk and listeners thank you also very much for joining me today i hope you enjoyed this episode again i want to thank our guest professor phil Matthews, for joining us and providing um his insight and i cannot wait for that book to come out you've now got me hooked and when that book comes out i'm gonna read it and I'll probably get a chance to review it on the channel because I also do uh, book reviews. I know people say I've only done ever fiction, but I've always wanted to do a nonfiction book review to like bring that discussion. So, uh, 
Brother Matthews, when that book comes out, let me know because I want to buy it. Thank you. You're absolutely welcome. And listeners, this concludes a wonderful interview today. I wish you all a wonderful rest of the day. And as I've mentioned before in my previous episode, um, I'm also doing a Q&A on the 25th. So go back to the previous episode to submit your questions on the comments. And until next time, this has been The Wandering Scribe and The Wandering Quill signing out. Have a nice day.